Welcome back to Ancient Military History, a channel dedicated to providing visual representation of how ancient militaries operated and waged war, going into detail about the real tactics they used to win battles, and showing you, the viewer, how this would have looked in ancient times. In this video, we will be going over the history and tactics used by the Romans in the Battle of Pharsalus that took place in 48 BC. It was an epic battle between two Roman generals, Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar. This clash of titans determined who would ultimately gain control of Rome, a republic stricken in two by civil war. Before the fall of the Roman Republic, the land was governed by anarchy and corruption and divided into factions. The plebeians and patricians, who were the commoners or nobility, and the populare and optimare ideologies, which respectively believed that the nation should be ruled in the interest of the people or ruled by the oligarchy. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, otherwise known as Pompey the Great, had twice served as consul, which was a year-long position of supreme power over the Republic. The successful and ambitious general had also received three triumphs, which were the highest honors that could be given Roman generals for his victories in North Africa Spain, and Western Asia. He also cleared the Mediterranean of its pirates. The equally impressive Gaius Julius Caesar had also served as consul, and he later went on to conquer and pacify the Gallic tribes. Both men during their consulships were dedicated to government reform and were opposed by the nobility, or optimates, in the Senate. Together with the richest man in Rome, Marcus Licinius Crassus, they formed an under-the-table alliance, later known as the First Triumvirate, and they dominated the Roman government and military commands for almost seven years. However, pride, jealousy, and personal ambition would be the ultimate downfall of the alliance. As Caesar's popularity, prestige, and wealth grew during his time as governor over Gaul, Crassus died in his own conquest for glory, and Pompey was left to deal with the civil unrest in Rome. With the Senate burned down by the mob, the magistrates had no choice but to appoint Pompey as sole consul to restore order, and Pompey thus found himself committed to the nobility despite the lack of trust between the two. Pompey and the Senate recalled Caesar to Rome and ordered him to relinquish command of his ten veteran legions so he could be tried as a private citizen for his former actions as consul. Caesar, of course, refused, and he marched his men across the Rubicon River, which was the first act of war, a war that would ultimately determine if the Greco-Roman world should continue to be governed by the nobility or replaced by an autocratic regime. After a series of battles in Italy and Spain, Pompey was pressured by the Senate to put an end to the civil war, which by then had been going on for over a year and a half. Pompey followed Caesar to Greece, and there they met on the plains of Pharsalus. This decisive battle between the decorated general and the strategic military conqueror would not only determine Rome's fate, but it would also demonstrate how strategy and tactics can overcome sheer numbers and result in its disastrous defeat. Caesar was noted for his use of speed and surprise in the Gallic Wars, often choosing an immediate attack with the troops at his disposal instead of waiting for more soldiers to arrive and regroup. The Battle of Pharsalus was no exception, and once again showed off his leadership skills, adaptability, and the fighting prowess of his legions. Pompey's army maintained its position on the high ground for several days. Each morning, Caesar would edge his legions closer to the hill, and Pompey would respond by moving his men a little farther down the slope. Caesar refused to meet Pompey on this disadvantageous ground, and he was in the process of striking his tents to march elsewhere, when he saw that Pompey had inexplicably descended onto the plain. Both sides prepared to engage in battle the following day. On August 9th, 48 BC, the Battle of Pharsalus, the ultimate battle for Rome, began. Pompey commanded 11 legions, a total of 47,000 men, many of whom were recent recruits from Rome, Greece, Syria, and Spain. 110 cohorts lined up in the Triplica Asias formation. The bulk of the cavalry, archers, and slingers, about 7,000 men, held the far left flank up against the low hills, while a smaller but seasoned contingent of cavalry and light infantry were stationed on the far right, and they were protected by the river in Epeus. 
While Pompey's best troops took their place on the wings, he also dispersed his veterans throughout the lines in order to support troops new to battle conditions. The full length of the front line would have been about two and a half miles, or four kilometers in length. Pompey's plan was to send his cavalry around the enemy flank and attack from the rear. Meanwhile, the infantry would press forward and Caesar's army would be crushed between the two movements. Pompey himself commanded the field from his position to the rear of the left wing. As for Caesar, he lined up his troops to mirror Pompey's positions. But to do so, he had to thin out his lines. At his disposal were only 22,000 men, divided into 80 cohorts, which was significantly fewer than his opponent. However, unlike Pompey's melange of new recruits whose loyalties were questioned by the Republic, Caesar commanded nine veteran legions who had fought by his side during the Gallic Wars. Caesar positioned himself opposite Pompey behind his best legion, the 10th Legion, on the right wing, and his light infantry were placed right of center. As a precaution against Pompey's superior cavalry numbers, almost 7,000 versus Caesar's 1,000, Caesar moved six cohorts, or 2,000 men, from his rear line to act as a reserve on his right flank, placing them at an oblique angle. At Caesar's order, his first and second lines charged forward for a short distance, before realizing that Pompey's legions had not responded. This tactic may have been to tire Caesar's infantry by making them cover more ground. However, seeing that Pompey's lines were not advancing, Caesar's men halted, regrouped, and, after a quick breather, continued their charge and launched their javelins at the enemy. Their opponents, still maintaining their positions, fired javelins of their own. Caesar's legions then rushed forward again, this time engaging in combat with their swords. At this point, Pompey ordered his left-wing cavalry to charge Caesar's right, and his mass of horses thundered across the plain, with his archers and slingers following behind. Caesar's own cavalry was quickly overwhelmed and even retreated a little. Pompey, seeing the success of his cavalry, began to divide them into smaller divisions in preparation for a coordinated flanking maneuver. But as they took the time to regroup, Caesar took the opportunity to attack. Neither Pompey nor his men saw the six cohorts planted behind Caesar's cavalry, whom he promptly withdrew, and he then sent forth his hidden reserve, telling his men to aim their javelins at the enemy's faces. The unexpected attack threw Pompey's cavalry into a panic, and they fled in a state of confusion. Pompey's archers and slingers, who were behind the cavalry, found themselves open to attack, and they too were completely routed and fled the battle, leaving Pompey's left wing entirely exposed. Furthermore, all three of Pompey's infantry lines were engaged in combat, and he had no contingency force to deal with the sudden attack on his left. Caesar, who had withheld his third line, which was comprised of his strongest reserve of veterans, unleashed his final legions to reinforce his first and second lines. Pompey's troops initially resisted the onslaught, but as his multinational allies began to desert the battle, the rest of his legions gave way and retreated for their camp in the hills. Pompey, disguised as an ordinary soldier, also retreated and fled to the nearby city of Larissa. With no general and completely surrounded by Caesar's legions, Pompey's army surrendered their arms. It is reported that about 15,000 were killed and another 24,000 were captured, while Caesar only suffered 230 dead or missing. However, as Caesar's reports were known to be tailored in his favor, these numbers should be taken with a grain of salt. Pompey fled across the Mediterranean Sea and was killed on the Egyptian shore. After cleaning up the remnants of opposition in Spain, Julius Caesar, undisputed victor of the Civil War, and now most powerful man in the ancient world, rose to become dictator of the Roman Republic. Thank you for watching Ancient Military History, your go-to resource for the strategies and tactics used by ancient militaries throughout history to conquer their foes. We are a brand new channel, and your support would mean the world to us. So, if you liked this video and would like to see more, Subscribe to the channel and check out our playlist where we cover other interesting ancient military battles. Also, let us know in the comments below which ancient military battle you'd like to see next. Until next time, thank you and have a wonderful day.